Thank you for coming bright and early. All right. So uh, here is the title of the slide that I sent out to the program. So today I promised I would talk about deploying interactive machine learning applications with Clipper, which is a big project in the RISE lab. Um, but as I was preparing my talk and thinking about what you would most like or what I could talk about that relates data science and data engineering in a really compelling way, I decided to change the focus of the talk and talk a bit more about the machine learning lifecycle as a whole, and then connect that back to the challenges in prediction serving. All right, so that's my plan for today. Uh, that's a lot. So before I go into the details of the talk, I want to briefly describe a little bit about me. Uh, so I am the co-director of the UC Berkeley RISE Lab, which is a new group uh, devoted to studying the design of uh, real-time, intelligent, uh, secure, and explainable systems. Uh, it's a group that connects machine learning research with research and system design, uh, database, data management, and security. So it's a really cool interdisciplinary project. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about research going on in that lab today, and I'm going to talk about how we're thinking about the machine learning lifecycle. So I also co-founded Turi. This is actually originally called Graph Lab, and then Dato, uh, and then Turi. Never let me name something. Uh, I change names all the time. Uh, so Turi was a project, uh, is a, a company, uh, that, that developed technologies for data scientists, uh, technologies that allowed them to compute more efficiently, uh, to apply more advanced machine learning algorithms in the single uh, processor to distributed processor setting, compute out of core. These are innovations that made it easier to do the early model development process, which I'll talk about more today. Um, I'm also a member of the Apache Spark PMC. I develop key parts of Apache Spark, including the, the GraphX uh, component of Apache Spark, which is uh, languishing. There's some more opportunities to improve graph processing in Spark. All right, so that's a bit about me. My research is in artificial intelligence. Uh, I do work in data science. I've been developing the data science curriculum at Berkeley. Uh, I've also done work in distributed database systems and graph processing systems. That's my background. All right. Uh, I'm also affiliated with a bunch of different groups, so the RISE Lab. I'm also part of the Berkeley AI Research Group, which is a new uh, group of faculty, a very large group of faculty studying uh, AI. I work on autonomous vehicles with the Deep Drive project. Uh, as I said, I'm also part of Apache Spark and, and Turi. All right, so as an academic, I get to make a conjecture. So I'm going to make a conjecture today that machine learning models are the next big data. And here's my evidence for that conjecture. First, everyone is talking about models, and very few people have them, which is sort of how big data was maybe eight years ago. There was a lot of excitement. Some people had it, some people didn't. Um, but it, it was, had the opportunity to shape things, right? And so big data does, and as models do in the future, have the opportunity to transform industries. And so when we think about machine learning and, and what its implications are on industries, it's potentially very big. Um, a neat thing is that uh, machine learning and this model development is really a consequence of big data. So as we've made progress in data engineering, we've enabled progress in model design, which will, in a sense, be the next wave of things we see from our data at scale. And then finally, and this is kind of the opportunity, is that today, the ability to get the full value out of these models requires advanced skills and expertise, specialized systems. Uh, and so as data engineers, improving this space could really have a big impact in our ability to use models in a wide range of contexts. All right, so some corollaries of that. Um, is that data engineers of the future are going to have to become model engineers, too. You're going to have to think about models as a new kind of data that we need to manage uh, throughout an entire life cycle. And we're going to need new tools to manage this machine learning life cycle. Um, and so as a research group, we started to ask, what does this machine learning life cycle look like? Uh, what are its components, and where are there opportunities to improve that space um, from a data management to a model management perspective? All right, so what I would was planning to do is spend the first maybe 15 minutes or so talking about the machine learning lifecycle as we have envisioned it in different components and some of the opportunities and some of the limitations of the technologies we have today. Um, so the machine learning lifecycle often begins with model development. If you ask a machine learning researcher, this is sort of the whole thing, right? So we developed the model, that's the cool part. Everything else after that's kind of meh, boring. Uh, model development is where we take data and, and build models. Uh, after we've done that, and I'll make a, a big argument for this, we then actually should have a second stage in which we train models. We really consume pipelines and produce uh, model, the actual models that we then use in a prediction context to provide value, to create services, to make better reports, and so on. So these are three key stages of, of the machine learning lifecycle, and we want to think about the challenges at each of these stages. What's kind of neat is they actually bring different groups of people together. 
So you have the data scientists deep in the, the, the weeds of model development. You have data engineers helping with the training process and the deployment of these models. And we'll actually see even in the model development, data engineering plays a critical role. All right, so model development, uh, this is the focus of most of machine learning. This is what we, in a sense, teach in the data science class, this life cycle. So I, I've broken into four kind of stages. Um, I'm going to focus on the top two and the bottom two and talk about some of the things that happen in those stages. Uh, so the top two are, are where we go from essentially getting data, collecting it, transforming it, and visualizing it. All right, so here we have to identify potential sources of data. So understanding the data we have is actually a big challenge as a data scientist. What data can I have access to? We have to join data from multiple sources. So we're going to start using some uh, perhaps relational tools to bring data together. And we have to identify keys or ways of connecting different types of data. Uh, we want to address the missing values, outliers, a standard process of data cleaning. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and then typically in this process, there's a big component of visualization. This is where the data scientist is trying to build insight about the data that they're trying to manipulate. So one of the neat things here, and this is an opportunity for the data engineer and the data scientist to work together, is that this does bridge understanding modeling with understanding the tools and the technologies needed to manipulate and get to that data. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for the data engineer to provide one of their strong skills to help bringing data together from different sources. Okay. Uh, I, I will add, so we teach in the data science class a lot of exciting things around model development. Uh, the reality is that model development is kind of boring. Uh, so a big part of developing models is really getting, preparing, and cleaning the data. Uh, I, there's an expert in data science once said that 80% of model development uh, is data cleaning this preparation process, and the 20, remaining 20% uh, is complaining about that first 80%. Uh, so this is a reality today, and, and in some sense, this is an opportunity for improvement, uh, making it easier to discover, to manipulate, and clean data for data science processes is something that we could really improve upon. And there are opportunities to actually use modeling techniques to work directly on, cleaning da or on dirty data and try to learn from that and maybe learn from the sources of, of dirt in that data as well. All right, so opportunities to improve data cleaning, but we've known this for some time. Uh, once we're done that process, we get to the perhaps more exciting part, which is the actual model development. We get to think about models, design new algorithms. So uh, in this process, we're going to be building uh, informative feature functions, so using our knowledge to capture how uh, to interpret the data for a model. Uh, this is getting, in some places, replaced by deep learning. Uh, we are designing new model architectures. This is the fun part again, so I get to think of how my neural net should look or how I'm going to combine my decision trees with linear models. Um, we often do a fair amount of tuning, training algorithms. Uh, and again, there's a, an emerging space of tools to manage that tuning process. And then we often need to do validation. Uh, and this is a part that's going to get increasingly trickier. Right? So what does it mean to validate a model? Is it accurate enough? Is it fast enough? Will it be accurate tomorrow? How do we check these things in a more principled way? Uh, and I'll talk a bit about some of the research we're doing to address that. All right, so this is, in a sense, where the data scientist is most happy. Uh, and this is a big part of the tooling and technologies we develop. All right, so if you look at what's being built today to help in the whole data science, machine learning lifecycle, all the energy is here right now. Helping the data scientist build that first model, collect, manipulate, transform data, and so on. So what is the consequence of, of model development? What should we get out of it? Right, so when we think of model development, the first thing we typically get out, and, and this is maybe what a lot of the technologies, including things developed at Turi, focused on is, is simple reports, visualizations, dashboards that let us understand the data. So the consequence is insight, not necessarily a solution to a problem, but understanding about the data or the domain that we're trying to, to leverage. Now, increasingly, there's excitement that we will take these models and use them to build new services. Right, so we'd like to imagine the, the outcome of model development is a model. Uh, and at this point, when I talk with my colleagues in databases, uh, they go, wait a second, what's a model? Uh, so I wanted to actually be a little bit more precise about what I mean when I say a model here. Um, so I'm interpreting or describing a model as a function from some input to some output, some prediction. Uh, and a model consists of two things. It consists of parameters. Um, and these parameters can be data. They are data. They can be tens of bytes. They can be tens to hundreds of gigabytes, depending on the kinds of models that we're using. And so just managing the parameters of the model actually is, in some cases, a challenging problem. 
Um, and then how we use those parameters is determined by the structure. This could be something as simple as a JSON file describing the structure of a neural net, or it could be a large collection of code that interprets those parameters and then executes them to make predictions. Right? So a model is this kind of weird thing that blends data, code, and structure in order to make a, a decision. All right, so we'd say the other outcome of model development is a model. But I want to make a case that that's a bad idea. You should not be making models in the process of model development. Counterintuitive. Uh, let me explain why. So why is it a bad idea to try to directly produce a model, a trained model during the process of model development? All right, so with just a trained model, what can we do? Well, one of the things we cannot do uh, is retrain that model, right? So you have a, a model, a data scientist that worked to produce this really amazing model. Uh, they've given it to you. You can't go back and say, I want to retrain that with new data. Uh, and I've actually gone to companies that are like, yeah, we have this really good model. Like, that's awesome. Uh, how often do you update it? Like, we can't update it. Why not? Because we don't have the code to make the model again. Uh, that was some complex process that was developed over a long period of time using different kinds of technologies. So we really don't want to be shipping models. Uh, we want to be shipping something else. All right, so we want to be able to retrain. We want to be able to track the code and the data. When things break, what was used to make that model? How do we debug it? Right, so again, shipping a model from the model development process makes it difficult to debug. We need to capture dependencies. To deploy a model, as I said earlier, combines data with structure and often code. I need to know what code was used during the evaluation or training of that model so that I can then use that code and its supporting libraries when I go to serve it. And then finally, we need to audit these models. Uh, it's increasingly the case that you're going to make predictions that someone comes back and goes, you know what, that prediction is inappropriate. How did you come to that prediction? Describe your modeling process. And these companies have said, you know what, we've got this really good model that our engineers built a few years ago. They're going to be in trouble because they don't know how that model came to be, the data that was used in that model. Right? So it might have to say, look, you can't have this user influencing that model. How do you remove a user from a model that's already been trained? All right, so the, my argument then is that you should not be producing models as a consequence of model development, but instead you should be producing training pipelines. So a training pipeline uh, is a way of describing the process of going from collections of data to trained models. So this is code, right? Uh, and in fact, maybe a way to think about it is an analogy in software engineering. Training pipelines are like code, right? So if we think of a model, it's much closer to something like a binary. And you do not want your developers finishing the development process and shipping you a binary. Uh, you want them to produce code, and you want tools, con continuous integration tools, to check that code and produce the actual binaries, the models that you would then use in a production context. All right, so training pipelines. I think that, and when we study this at Berkeley, that's one of the things we've pushed towards. And if you look at some of the earlier projects like Keystone, we start to specify ways of, of not just building a model, but the entire construction, uh, the, the process of building the model that we can then reuse in other settings uh, that we can check in and rerun in, in a production context. All right, so training pipelines can then be consumed in the process of training. So we've broken the process of training, made it distinct from the process of model development. All right, so now in the process of training, we can use a new set of tools. And the neat thing here is now it's a data engineer managing these pipelines, the build process for models. Uh, we can train the models at scale on live data. The pipelines can be reused. Uh, we can retrain on new data as it arrives. Uh, we can automatically validate the models and check their prediction accuracy. So we might, as we retrain, introduce additional tests. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, one of the things we might want to do in the design of pipelines is introduce a mechanism to impose constraints in that model, uh, in the resulting models, a way of unit testing. We want to manage model versioning. Uh, and when I look at a lot of the startups building tools for model development, this is actually a big step forward. Just saying, hey, this is version five of that model. Uh, knowing its lineage and the data that uh, was used to make that version can be very useful uh, for debugging things when version five breaks. Uh, and the neat thing is that when we frame it this way, training actually requires minimal expertise in the models. Training is really about taking these pipelines and instantiating them at scale. And it provides a nice division of skills so we can have experts in managing these big data systems, and these big compute resources, focusing on what they're good at. Uh, and then model development uh, is focusing on the design of the pipelines that they are then going to execute. So training technologies are also an area where we see a lot of development. Uh, a lot of the tools that we look at for, wor for workflow management are becoming a big part of how we deal with training. I have 
graduate students and colleagues are saying, look, we need to start using Airflow in our, in our machine learning research. That's kind of cool. So using new workflow tools to manage the, the training process. But there are some limitations to those tools, and I'll get to that in a moment. We're also using new scalable frameworks. And actually, these are kind of neat, because a lot of these are systems researchers or systems engineers building really high-performance tools for machine learning, and in many ways transforming even that early model development process by having very scalable systems to do learning. All right, so I said there are a few open problems. Um, so I want to talk about some of the open problems in this space. Maybe the biggest problem is context. So as we build these systems that span different technologies for machine learning, for data management, uh, as we use different teams to, to, to develop and to train models, we often lose context. Uh, and I want to talk about what, what context we need to capture so that we can better uh, deploy, manage, debug these kinds of models. And another neat trend is we have this emergence of composition. It is no longer the case that a model is a, an atomic thing that lives on its own. Uh, we are starting to compose the models that other teams build uh, to improve our models. And that actually has a unique opportunity to leverage work, just as we do with software, uh, to be more efficient about machine learning. Uh, but it has a big challenge or a big uh, drawback that we'll need to address. All right, so contact. What we need to track is the how, the what, and the who. So how is how was the model or data created? We need to know the relationship between uh, the data creation process and the model. Um, we often want to know what is the latest or best versions of, datas and, of data and models. And it, it goes without saying, we also need to track the code involved in each of these steps. And we also need to know who is responsible, so being able to track across people. Because remember, these techniques are no longer isolated to a single data scientist, but now span multiple teams. Um, and sometimes there is expertise that is hard to capture in the code, the data, and the model that you need to capture by knowing the people, at least, involved in those processes. So the introduction of pipelines, of focusing not on the creation of models, but the specification of their creation process, uh, does help address some of these things. Uh, but there are still some limitations. Right? So we, we need to track these relationships across different things. We track it across code. Uh, what we've started to see is a lot of machine learning students, data science students, even students in my classes, starting to use Git to track their model development process, and in some cases to track their model and their data as well, which has its problems. Um, so we do want to be able to track model and data. We want to track multiple versions of that, but using a system like Git to track our gigabytes of, of files and checking them into our course website is a terrible idea. Uh, it is not an efficient way to manage a system. Uh, so we need better ways to associate versions of data, versions of models, with versions of code. And then people. Uh, this often gets overlooked, but as I said earlier, we need ways to track who is responsible for this particular data set, uh, or who is responsible for the features used in this model. Um, and that becomes more important as we start to deal with things in composition and things break. Uh, one of the challenges of machine learning is that I can't write down a really clean API specification for this model I've just produced or unit tests that can really, really carefully check that. And so when someone else consumes that and things go wrong, people are involved. It's necessary to actually communicate across people to solve these problems. So tracking those relationships, in a sense, being able to blame uh, is a critical uh, need. All right, so that's context. Composition. So again, an exciting pattern is that people are starting to put models together to solve bigger problems. Uh, so suppose I wanted to build a cuteness classifier. I might want to do that to maybe show the cutest pictures on the front of my website. Uh, let's imagine that this is an ostensibly cute dog, uh, and I have a classifier for cuteness. I might be able to actually build a better classifier for cuteness if I could take someone else's classifier for puppies and someone else's classifier for balls. So I put those in as features. That model is likely to actually be a really good model, an improved model for cuteness. And so I could go to my database of models, a, a TensorFlow hub, if you will, and find the models that, I'm, uh, that might be used for this application and add those as features to my model. All right, so this is actually an empowering way to think of model development. It is what we do in software engineering. It is time we do it with models as well. Uh, but there's a problem, right? So here comes a cat. Let's all agree that this is also a cute cat with a ball. All right. So we fed it to the puppy detector, and for whatever reason, the puppy detector said, yes, that is a puppy. That's wrong, but it actually might have been helpful. And when we trained our cuteness detector, and it, it realized that, you know what, this puppy detector gets cats wrong, 
It might say, well, if it's uh, a puppy, that's a really good signal. I don't need to know if it's a cat. So in a sense, models are really good at exploiting bugs in our other models. Right? So when we make a, a model a feature, the, the, uh, the new model, the cuteness detector, can leverage the bugs in the earlier models to improve its own accuracy. Now we have a brilliant data scientist that comes along, you know what, that puppy detector is broken. And they go and fix the puppy detector. And now the puppy detector is correct. It says, no, this is not a puppy. Right? But that's a problem because the cuteness detector was assuming that the puppy detector would get that wrong. It was leveraging uh, that signal. So now the cuteness detector is worse. So an improvement in one artifact in our system actually made other artifacts of the system worse. And this is hard to deal with. So how do we diagnose these problems? Right? So a big opportunity, but we need ways to, to track the, the, uh, the problems that composition creates. So we want to be able to track composition. We need to be able to validate end-to-end -end accuracy. So when that first data scientist came in and said, you know what, I can fix this model, and then they fix it, it'd be nice to actually say, hey, you fixed that model, but you broke all these other models in the process of doing that. Right? Now, there are simple solutions. If we actually can manage this training process in a, a more CI-like structure, then perhaps we can retrain all the models downstream so they can compensate for the improvements in the upstream models. But even then, it's possible that your puppy detector was really useful signal, and the fact that it was getting it wrong was important. So at least being able to find the people responsible for those upstream models or downstream models uh, can be critical. And then we need ways of doing unit testing and integration testing. This connects to the, the challenge of doing end-to-end -end testing. Uh, but it would be nice to actually be able to test these individual components. Leverage things like uh, the cuteness detector might have assumed that most of the things it sees are puppies, because most things are puppies or cats. And all of a sudden, when you start getting the puppy detection correct, and it sees far fewer puppies, that might be a, a signal, a warning, that you have a bug uh, or a, a, a change in the input distribution. Right? So we'd like to be able to detect things like covariate shift. All right, so this opens up great research opportunities, and that's something we like to study in the RISE, in the RISE lab. How can we improve this machine learning lifecycle? How can we bring ideas and data management uh, to these problems? And so I want to mention two projects. Uh, the first is Ground. Uh, Ground is an open, uh, open source uh, context management service. Um, the goal of Ground is to span multiple systems. You can kind of think of it as something like a hive catalog, but for everything. Uh, so we want to track the people, the data, uh, the code across different technologies uh, in an open way. And so what Ground does is it actually introduces a fairly uh, open data model built around a graph that can associate versions of, uh, versions of, of artifacts along with the people and the changes that happen to those versions. Uh, as a consequence, systems like uh, Hive or Spark or Pandas or scikit-learn, uh, can publish and subscribe to this service. So we made it extensible so you could build uh, different technologies on top of it. Um, and one of those technologies we've been exploring is a system we call Floor, which goes nicely with Ground. Uh, so the Floor system is an experiment management system we've been developing at Berkeley. Now there's actually a lot of excitement today around the design of experiment management technologies. Uh, and a lot of those, again, connect to how we manage the data and the code. What we've been doing with Floor is trying to help with false discovery. So we want to actually track everything, including when you look at stuff. Uh, so the design of Floor is, is set to track your entire Python workflow, um, all the intermediate artifacts, and associate those data artifacts with versions of the code and the actions you take on them. Right? And as a consequence, we can do things like flag that you've looked at thousands of plots of all the features, and you should not be surprised you found something interesting. So help with the, the problems of false discovery. And so what's nice about both these projects is they actually do, in, in, in many ways, span data systems, data science, and even statistics. So both these are open source projects. Ground is a bit more mature. And in fact, it's being co-developed with uh, several industrial groups. Um, Floor is a brand new project um, that hopefully will have big changes in the next uh, few months as, as the team of graduate students uh, continues to build it. All right, so that's model development and training. And now I get to the whole point of this talk, which is inference. Uh, and so this is the remaining step in this process of the machine learning life cycle. Um, in, in some ways, this is the one that's uh, least developed, in part because very few people make it all the way to this part of the process. Uh, so we have increasingly fewer models that all move all the way to production uh, and go beyond dashboards and, and become parts of services. So here, the goal is to make predictions. And we want to do this in tens of milliseconds under heavy load. 
And this whole process is now complicated by the introductions of deep neural networks or these very large random forests that really substantially increase the cost of computation, and in some cases even storage. Um, and so it requires developments in both algorithms and systems. Today I'm going to focus on systems, but we have a lot of really exciting research around new kinds of algorithms for predictions that leverage cascades or uncertainty to reduce the costs of evaluating these new kinds of models. So what are the technologies for prediction serving? So here's a few of the open source ones I found. There are some commercial offerings as well. In fact, all the major cloud providers now have some kind of offering for prediction serving. But I want to talk about some patterns in these open source offerings. Um, so Clipper is a system we've been building in the UC Berkeley RISE lab. Some of these other systems are actually very impressive, although in many cases focused on particular kinds of models or particular modeling tasks. Uh, that's actually not, that's not a, a bad thing. In many cases, those are all the models you need. Uh, but with Clipper, we're trying to design a more general framework that can support and compose a wide range of models. And so now I get to the key part of this talk with just a few minutes remaining. Uh, and so here's what I want to allude to in the remainder of this talk. I want to discuss some of the challenges of prediction serving. I want to talk a bit about the Clipper architecture and some of the insights we learned in the design of Clipper. And then I want to talk a little bit about the open source effort. Uh, Clipper is a big open source project with a large number of, of graduate students and, in fact, actually now undergrads developing the project in collaboration with some industrial groups. All right, so prediction serving challenges. Two big challenges. One is the emergence of these really interesting and complex and computationally expensive models that require some specialized hardware accelerators uh, in many settings. And two, and maybe more important, uh, is the trend towards the composition of different models and frameworks for individual prediction tasks. It is no longer the case that a company has just one model and one system and one prediction task. We often have many tasks, many models, and many systems. Uh, so we need to address both these problems. The first, the need to support big models. So not all models are big. In fact, many prediction tasks have fairly simple models. But as we build these more exciting, personalized models, uh, neural networks, they increase the cost of computation. In many cases, they can take tens of gigaflops to make a single prediction. This would be expensive. They're being deployed along the critical path. They can't fail. And they have to do this under heavy load. And to support that, we've been using things like GPUs, uh, advanced in hardware acceleration, parallel computation, allocating multiple cores to a single model. So it is actually a new computational challenge. It's not just a data challenge. Um, and actually, to point to how big of a challenge this was, you actually can look at Google Translate. Neat story. So uh, if you look at the Google Translate, uh, in order to serve these translations of words, they have to do about 140 billion words a day. Um, and if you use the calculations they provide in their paper, that amounts to roughly uh, 82,000 GPUs running 24-7, assuming uniform load. We don't actually have uniform loads. You're going to need to provision more than that. That's a lot of GPUs. And so Google's doing the back of the envelope calculations and starting to think about other things like voice technology, which likewise are going to demand these new expensive models. And they decided they needed to develop a new processor. So the TPU was actually designed not for that whole model development process, but address the challenges of serving. So once you mature the level where you are really trying to deploy lots of models, this actually becomes the bigger computational and the more expensive computational challenge. So what we see when we look at a lot of these big organizations that have a, a service like Google Ads or uh, voice translation, in many cases, they're building specialized models specialized systems to support those models for an entire very specialized service. Uh, and that is a good solution when you have a billion dollar service you need to run. It makes sense to, to put a lot of resources into a single model framework. Um, but there are problems when we try to think about that in a broader context. Right? So it is expensive to build and probably more importantly to maintain each of these specialized systems for each of these services. Uh, it requires expertise across machine learning and systems. So it's expensive in the human uh, capital needed to support that. It also leads to tightly coupled models and applications. It makes it hard to innovate on the application or model independently because they are so closely coupled. And in many cases, it only supports a single machine learning framework. And the downside to that, as we saw, is that there's a constant competition between frameworks. What's the best framework today? Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are many best frameworks today. There's PyTorch, there's TensorFlow, there's Scikit-Learn. My graduate students are constantly switching all their code between PyTorch and TensorFlow with every you know, update in each of these software systems. Right? So the frameworks are changing. We can't just support one. Um, and we also, as I said, not supporting one, but many different prediction applications. So we have a picture that looks a lot more like this. Many applications and many different frameworks supporting each of those applications. 
Right? That's intentionally supposed to look like a mess because it is a mess. Uh, so how do we deal with this mess? Uh, so if you're a, a data engineer, and many of you are, uh, you might actually adopt a, a fairly simple solution to supporting many of these different applications. And that solution is to prematerialize predictions uh, into a data management system and then use that as your serving uh, environment. So what does that look like? We return to our picture of training and inference and actually go back to training. And during the process of training, or in fact right after the process of training, we use a big uh, a batch processing framework to take all the possible queries we might see and materialize to pre-predict all the predictions we might need and then store them into some serving or scoring environment or store them into a database. This process is called scoring. One of the advantages of this approach is that we're actually able to live in the batch data engineering space. We can use the tools that we've developed over time, the, the tools that we understand well. Then once we've constructed this database, we can then go to a serving environment. Again, we're using the tools that we understand well. We're taking our data management system, uh, and we're having our application asking to look up particular values, and those values are return delivering that service. Right, so this does simplify things, uh, and it lets us have that low latency that we need for prediction serving. But I'm also going to argue that this has some big problems as well. So one is that we require a full set of queries ahead of time. That works when you're just trying to score a set of products for a small number of users. But if you're trying to process voice or natural language or comments, this becomes much harder. Uh, so you need a small and bounded input. It can require substantial computation and storage space. Imagine trying to materialize all the predictions for all the content and all the users uh, at maybe different points of the day. Right? So this can be very expensive to pre-compute. And it becomes more costly to update. We'd like to imagine we can update our models or adjust them over time. If every single time we have to update a model, we then have to pre-compute all the possible predictions it might make. It becomes a very computationally and storage intensive task. So now I finally get to the big point that I wanted to make about these systems, and I'll talk very briefly about how we solve these problems, uh, and then I will take some time for some questions. So our approach is to actually build a middle layer, which if you're a networking person, that's exactly what you see in this picture is that we need some form of abstraction that can sit between these machine learning frameworks, use them in their native capacity, provide a common abstraction, and then apply these system optimizations needed for real-time serving above the batch uh, training and prediction frameworks. Right, so to find a middle ground between these specialized systems uh, and the pre-materialization strategy. And that is precisely what the Clipper project does. It sits as a middle layer application between these different frameworks, and it then uses those native frameworks inside of Docker containers that are then isolated so you can have separate environments for each of your models and still compose them and optimize them in one common system. So the design of Clipper, uh, the core system itself is about 10,000 lines, probably a bit more now, 10,000 lines of C++ and Python. So we designed it using kind of low level tools to focus on latency and in fact predictable latency. Uh, it's, open, it's an open source project under the Apache license. Uh, it was designed for production level uh, query traffic. So we do research, but in this particular system, we wanted a real system that we could study at scale. Uh, so we wanted to deliver low latency uh, and predictable latency predictions. So we wanted to manage both the, the tail effects and the, the mean behavior. Um, and as I said, this is a research project, but it is also a real software artifact that we are continuing to develop, uh, much in the same spirit as Apache Spark uh, in the Rise Lab. So architecturally, what does that mean? So the, the implementation of Clipper uh, is the following. So we have applications that interact with Clipper inside of a Docker container, and all of the models themselves also live inside of Docker containers. So we provide some isolation. Management is something we also think about as, again, a production level system should. So the state of Clipper is managed in a Redis database uh, currently, that we're looking at other ways of managing the state. Uh, and then we have separate tools to actually interact with the Clipper system uh, through this database. And then because, again, we want to build a real system, uh, we built in support for Prometheus monitoring of logs and metrics of each of the models, uh, and it makes pretty plots that my students have shown me. All right, so nice way of actually deploying it. Uh, we went to some companies and said, look, put this in production. You're like, well, <laughs> there's one more thing. Uh, we, we want this in Kubernetes. Uh, so we then work to integrate with the Kubernetes environment so it can be managed through Kubernetes. Uh, and so it can live alongside other applications in a serving environment. Right? So this is research, but this is a production level system, and that is the goal of this project. All right, so I will uh, talk briefly about how you can get started. So we have tutorials for Clipper. Uh, it's at clipper.ai. 
Um, we have Docker images on Docker Hub for the system, and we're continuously developing them. Uh, we have Clipper admin tools that let you get started by just using pip. So you can pip install uh, the Clipper admin package, and it will launch things for you. Uh, and the goal is to be able to get up and running without compiling. But this is a real open source project, and we have open contributors. And we encourage you to check it out, download it, and compile and contribute back. Um, so I want to then, in the remaining, let's say four minutes, mention a few of the key innovations in Clipper, things that are, are part of the research that if you were building your own prediction serving system, you might also want to incorporate. Um, so one of the first, and maybe simple, but really big insights was to containerize everything. Rather than try to build a monolithic system, and we did, uh, rather than try to build a monolithic system which has all the models within that, that serving environment, the idea was to break into lots of little pieces that we can then manage in isolation. We then, as a consequence of that, are now able to lift a lot of the system optimizations above these frameworks. So we can introduce things like caching and batch optimization that are critical to efficient inference in a, uh, a GPU or a highly parallel CPU. Uh, and then we can do things like cross-framework learning. So we can actually learn above the prediction. So it's essentially injecting a model above you, the model you've already trained and allowing that model to adapt quickly to feedback. So we can start to learn and even personalize models that themselves are not able to learn or personalize. So the architecture of Clipper, as I said, de decouples the system. Uh, each of the uh, model containers uh, is a separate uh, Docker container. It's isolated from the rest. It allows us to then use the tools, the original code, and systems required for training those models in serving. As we talked to a bunch of companies, they say, well, we were looking at these, at that time, PMML technologies. Uh, it's just not a good way to capture the entire pipeline that you have for rendering a prediction in a way that works across systems. So there's this lost in translation as the model is developed and then re-implemented in the serving context. We got rid of that by essentially using exactly the same tools as in development in serving. But that means we have to address some of the mismatch by introducing batching and caching techniques above that to get the performance we need, the reliable, low latency uh, SLOs needed for prediction serving. Uh, we made it fairly simple to introduce new kinds of models and frameworks. And we added RPC support for C++, Java, Python, and then recently R. So we can serve models in all of these different languages uh, with their corresponding low latency, uh, low and reliable latency guarantees. Um, and as I said, because it's in a container now, you can package with your model. And we've built some default containers, but you can build your own. Uh, all the dependencies you need to support that prediction. And that means you can have different versions of Spark, different versions of Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow all working together to render a single prediction. As I said earlier, we get resource isolation. We also get scaling. So we notice that as a particular model becomes more popular, you can actually automatically add more instances of that model. And this, the front-end application doesn't know that anything's changed. It just gets faster. So we can automatically scale individual components, again, even in a single prediction. Right? So a, a single prediction might actually call all of these models at once. All right, and so as I said, there are a few key innovations interior to the system. So we built this common abstraction layer, which allows us to then support a wide range of models with a simple API. Um, and that's leveraging the fact that most predictions are really simple functions that take some uh, basic input and produce some, some output. Um, and then on top of that, we did things like automatic learning across these different models, so a model composition layer. I'm going to skip some of the batching optimizations. There's some really cool work in how you automatically tune the execution to get efficient predictions on a GPU. Uh, we'll post the slides, and you can take a look at that. It's good research. Uh, I'll briefly mention some of the cool things that happens in model selection and composition. So I can take multiple models into a single prediction. And the way we might do that is I can have different versions of a single model combined with other kinds of models. And I can combine all of those to make a single prediction. And I can use the uncertainty across these versions and across these models to start to measure the uncertainty in my system. This is not an ideal measure of uncertainty, but it's maybe a surrogate that we could use to make better predictions. And we started to study some of the consequences of that. Right, so if the, each of the models predicts cat, then we might be more certain. If certain models say, oh, that's also DJ, we might be a little bit unsure. Uh, and so we can actually play with this. So if we take these ensembles and we say we introduce a new class, which is I don't know, or IDK. So the model can now predict, I don't know. Uh, if we do that, we find that we can use this notion of uncertainty. And for a tiny fraction, so right here, this little bar here, a little bit, so a small fraction of the workload, we say we're unsure. And if we had made the prediction, we'd be terribly wrong. Right? But the things that we're now sure about that we're willing to make the prediction, their accuracy just got better. 
So we can improve upon the state of the art by doing almost nothing. We can do it above the models themselves. Right? So it's a way that the serving environment can actually improve accuracy. So, so, ah, you know what, I will skip well, a few key exciting points. So uh, we focused on easy model development. We now have support for a pretty wide range of common machine learning frameworks. As I said earlier, we've introduced a lot with uh, metrics and monitoring. Uh, the project's under active development, 22 contributors, including eight uh, industrial groups. Uh, so we're working in, with production deployments in SAP, Scotiabank, uh, Pacific uh, AI, and ARM. So actively trying to explore the use of this technology in the real world. So I'll conclude by saying I made a case for model and data engineering. I mean, I think that uh, some of the opportunities and challenges we've outlined here will transform the way we build machine learning pipelines in the future. And it's an exciting area to be doing research and to be building systems. I talked a bit about the machine learning life cycle, actually a lot about it, and I talked about some of the opportunities and, and weaknesses in each of these steps, and then we talked quite a bit about the Clipper prediction serving system and some of the ways in which we've started to think about how to do prediction serving differently. And so with that, I'd like to thank you, and I'd be happy to take a few questions. You know, we have microphones, so if you, if you want to ask questions, we have microphones. So it's uh, really cool prediction work. Yeah. It's very exciting. I think that that's really needed. Uh, the thing that got me even more excited was your talk about canonical, canonical data pipelines mm -hmm. to, to get to the prediction step. Yep. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Tell us yes. where is the GitHub for data pipelines? And is that something you guys are working on? Or like so everything in Clipper is amazing. I'm just that first, that big pipeline thing. There's a reason yeah. I brought in the talk to not just focus on Clipper. Yeah. Uh, so the pipeline part is, is uh, particularly exciting. Let me actually talk about my, my errors in naming again. Uh, the floor project used to be called the Jarvis project. Uh, Jarvis is a very popular name, so we decided maybe we shouldn't call it that. Uh, one of the reasons we did call it Jarvis is that we were thinking, what would the Jenkins of machine learning look like? What would a continuous integration uh, framework do? Uh, and so when we started, Jarvis, now called Floor. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is be able to capture the pipeline. Uh, and so we, we actually were looking at Jarvis in contrast to something like Airflow. So we wanted to be able to capture all the stages, the code, and the data. So we look at something like Airflow. It's convenient and it's agnostic to the underlying modeling components. If I put that in contrast to ML Lib, uh, Keystone um, ML, uh, scikit-learn pipelines, each of these builds a pipeline, a, a way of describing each of your data transformations with your models, but all tied to a particular framework. Uh, it takes something like Airflow, it doesn't care, it's just running code. Uh, the problem with something like Airflow is it doesn't really track the data. That's sort of outside of the scope of the system. But when you're developing models, you do want to know about the versions of the data that were used. You'd like to track that as well. So we started with Jarvis thinking about how to capture that pipeline. The current version of Floor, again, derived from Jarvis, uh, actually has some annotation tools that you can now instrument in Python only, currently, each step of your pipeline. And you can call out to an external library and say, uh, this is going to, you can tell Jarvis, you're going to run some external code, and it should track the final file that's produced. I don't care how that's going to happen, so I don't actually have insight into the, what the code's doing, but I do know which code was run and the file that was produced, and I can version those two things. Um, that's an early step. I think there are a big opportunity to build a pipeline framework that can span different machine learning tools, data transformation tools that can track code, data, and people. Uh, and that's where we want to take the floor project, uh, but that's, that's the big opportunity. So what about a pipeline uh, for production, meaning you get this amazing model, it's mm -hmm. complex, instead of taking 10 parameters in, it takes a million. Uh, how do you scale that? So that's, that's the other thing, getting from a uh, development pipeline to a production pipeline that I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a great answer. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities once you go from development to training to make that more efficient, to decide when to retrain a model as new data arrives, uh, to validate a model, to make sure you're not overfitting in that process, and then to take that knowledge and use it during prediction serving, which also needs to know about the transformations that were used uh, to transform the new inputs at query time. Uh, at scale, yeah. Uh, actually, I'll add one more thing. So one of the new things we're doing in Clipper right now, and my students are working on it, hopefully, uh, is a system called Inferline, which actually allows you to automatically provision a cluster. So one of the big challenges in model serving is knowing how many GPUs, how many CPUs, and how to split your models over those GPUs and CPUs to get the throughput you need with the latency requirements that you need for the appropriate batch size of each of those systems to make them efficient. Uh, 
and to do all of that for these complex compositions. And so we've been studying a way of using arrival processes, so models of how data, uh, how queries are arriving, to optimally tune these systems to minimize cost. Uh, it's actually pretty challenging work, uh, but it is possible to profile models and then find a good cl cluster allocation, uh, an optimal cluster allocation that brings down cost. 